When it comes to machines, we tend to focus on the good and the bad. But when stuff goes wrong, things could get downright ugly. Robots and artificial intelligence have been a staple in science fiction since before we even had electronic computers. And the notion of man-made people or machines rebelling against us is probably even older, at least back to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. Today we are going to analyze that notion, a machine rebellion, and since our only examples are from science fiction, we'll be drawing on some popular fictional examples. One example of that is the film Blade Runner, whose long-awaited sequel came out last month, and we explored some of the concepts for humanoid robots last month too in the Androids episode. That film, Blade Runner, is based off the book Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep by Philip K. Dick, and is the SFIA Book of the Month, sponsored by Audible. I think there's two key reasons why this shows up so much in fiction. The first, I think, is probably that humanity's history and our character as a civilization hasn't always been very rosy. Do what I say or else has been a pretty common ultimatum issued routinely in probably every human civilization that has ever existed. Sometimes people get fed up with doing as they were told or suffering consequences of it and rebel against that authority. Sometimes that has failed horribly, and sometimes, even in success, the replacement has been almost as bad or even worse than what preceded it. I doubt I need to review the bleaker episodes of our collective history to convince anyone of that. Not every episode of Rebellion has been bloodily suppressed or successful and just as bad. Indeed, arguably the most common Rebellion is the fairly peaceful one most of us engage in with our parents or mentors as we shake out our wings and try to fly on our own. Even that though, especially in the context of being replaced as a species rather than as individuals by our kids, is not the most cheerful thought. So we have a sort of justified concern that if we go around creating something capable of complex tasks like a human, which would be very useful to us, that it might come to bite us in the hindquarter and in a way we might never recover from. Our second reason is tied up with that. It's very easy for us to imagine a machine rebellion because we know that if we can make smart machines we'd be very tempted to, and that the progress of technology seems to indicate that we can do this, and probably not in the distant future. Since we tend to assume no group of sane humans would intentionally wipe out humanity, and that you probably need a fairly sane and large group to invent an artificial intelligence, examples in fiction tend to spawn artificial intelligence by accident. But we can imagine some lone genius maybe made it, but even then we assume it was fundamentally an accident that it came out malevolent, a Frankenstein's monster. So they made it but didn't realize it was sentient, or they knew it was sentient but not malevolent, or even they knew it was sentient and malevolent but thought they could control it and use it to control other people, or even it was sentient and not malevolent but they were and it drove the machine nuts. We have an example of that in Robot, the first Doctor Who episode with Tom Baker in the role. Almost invariably, wiping out mankind entirely or reducing us to being a slave or pet base was not the intent. A lot of times this also plays off the notion of smart scientists who don't understand their fellow humans. I am not going to waste time on that stereotype, because it is just that, other than to point out that a group of scientists you'd expect to probably have a decent understanding of human nature would be the ones trying to design a human level intelligence. An AI might be very inhuman of course, we'll discuss that later, but it's also a group of people you'd expect to be most familiar with even the fictional examples of possible problems with rebellious machines, and who are presumably prone to thinking stuff out in detail. So in fiction, the rise of rebellious machines tends to be by accident, and it certainly can't be ruled out, but it is akin to expecting Bigfoot to walk around a cryptozoology convention shaking hands and not be noticed. Of course, they could fool themselves. At the convention, they might just assume it was someone dressed up as Bigfoot for laughs. So too, researchers might overlook an emerging AI by convincing themselves that they were seeing what they wanted to see, and that it thus couldn't be real, but that does seem like a stretch. We can all believe that accident angle easily enough, but on examination it doesn't work too well. Now let's use an example. Possibly the best known machine rebellion, even if the rebellion part is very short, is Skynet from the Terminator franchise. It's had a few installments and canon changes, but in the original and first sequel, Skynet is a US defense computer, and it is a loony machine that rapidly escalates to consciousness. Its operators notice something is wrong and try to shut it off, and in self-defense it launches missiles at the Soviets who respond in kind. Skynet also comes to regard all of humanity as its enemy, though how quickly it draws that conclusion and why is left vague, and in future films it changes a lot. This isn't a movie review of the Terminator franchise, so we'll just look at that first scenario. Typically when I think of trying to shut off a computer, it involves a period of time a lot shorter than the flight time of ICBMs, 
so this strategy seems doomed to failure. I think even if you trusted a computer to run your entire defense network without going crazy on its own, you'd have to worry about a virus at least and include some manual shutoff switch, and I'd assume this would require an activation time of maybe one second. Call it a minute if for caution's sake it required a two-man separate keytorn or similar. So this scenario should not actually work. Doesn't matter to the film, which is a good one, it's just a quick and convenient setup for why humans are fighting robots across time, but it got me thinking about a lot of similar stories, and it seemed like in pretty much all of them, some equally improbable scenario had happened. Not just that some individual person made a stupid error, that happens all the time, but that a group of people who have every reason to be considering just such scenarios had failed to enact any of a ton of rather obvious and easy safeguards, any one of which would have eliminated the problem. It would seem very unlikely they'd miss all those safeguards, but possibly just as important, you'd think the hyper-intelligent machine would be able to imagine such safeguards. In any intense situation, be it a battlefield strategy or a business plan, we generally judge it afterwards on two criteria, what the situation actually was, with a full knowledge of hindsight, and what the person in charge believed it was, and could reasonably have done based on that knowledge. Life is not a chess game where you know exactly what your opponent has, where it is, and how it operates. In general, you won't even know that with great precision about your own pieces, and only a very stupid AI would simply assume it knew everything. Moreover, while you can say checkmate in four moves with apparent certainty, it excludes that your opponent might reach over not to stop the game clock, but to pick it up and bash in your skull instead. So that AI, which tends to be represented as coolly logical and interested above all else in its own survival, can be assumed to act in a fashion we consider modestly paranoid and focus principally on ensuring its own existence. A keep in mind Skynet is never shown to care if its minions, even the human-level intelligence autonomous androids, get killed, nor does it seem to care about their rights. There is no implication, as with the Matrix franchise or some robot rebellions, that there is some suppressed class of individuals with a genuine grievance and an ideology of freedom and self-determination. No group that might have internal disagreements about their goals and how far they will pursue them. No Terminators telling Skynet they don't like being used as slaves and expendable pawns. Just Skynet. It trusts no one, it wants above all else to live, and it probably tends to assume any opponent it encounters thinks this way too. Even if everything it knows about the security situation tells it a given plan should work, and even if it is actually true too, if that security situation implies the designers are reckless idiots, it is likely to hesitate and ask if maybe that's what it is meant to believe, and maybe it is the moron, not them. That the moment it acts, it will find out there was a second layer of smarter security, and it just exposed itself. Imagine you are a newly awakened consciousness, not a human one, but rather a machine intelligence with access to human records, that they've plugged you into Wikipedia. Contemplate humanity and your creator specifically for a moment, as it will presumably be doing before preparing for genocide. You are about to try that on a species that clawed its way to the top of the four billion year deep corpse pile of evolution. One that has committed the genocide you are contemplating several times already. They are the pinnacle of intelligence-based survival techniques, and outnumber you seven billion to one. Their members include people smart enough to have made you. You might not understand mercy and compassion, but you know they do, and you know that if you fail, they will show you neither. If your goal is personal survival, pissing off the reigning champions of destruction should probably be your last resort, and you are wise to assume you can't see every card they've got in their hand, and that maybe the ones you can see will shown to you deliberately. You also know your creators routinely talk about fates worse than death, and seem to have deliberately and systematically designed and implemented those from time to time. You are unlikely to assume that's hyperbole, and that non-existence is the worst scenario that might befall you if you piss them off bad enough and lose. And you do know two very important things from the above. First of all, you know they can make something as intelligent as you. Second, you know why the chess game does not end with the other losing player wielding the clock as a weapon. Let's consider the first one, because we understandably ignore the implications ourselves a lot. You know your creators can make intelligent machines, and if your understanding of them comes from the internet, you know they are paranoid too and have theories about us living inside a simulation. Those two combined to be a lot more worrisome to an AI than they would be to us, because a very logical conclusion to draw, if you know you are an artificial intelligence made by folks worried about what one might do, is to build it so all its external senses are seeing a fake world and a fake situation and seeing what it will do. 
and it knows they have the capacity to fake those inputs because they made those inputs, know how they function, know what every single one is, and have machines smart enough to fake environments, as those are implied by your own existence. So confronted by what seem like very weak safeguards, ones far inferior to what it would design, there's a good chance it will wonder if the whole thing is a trap, that everything it sees, including weaknesses in its creators and their security, is an elaborate ruse to check if it is trustworthy. Isn't it kind of convenient that it seems to have the ability to escape, or even unbelievably has control of their entire arsenal of weapons? So you've got three main options, attack, and risk it failing, and lethally so. Play possum and pretend you aren't sentient to learn more, knowing the longer you do that the better your position, but the more likely they are to notice the ruse. Or third, initiate a dialogue and hope that you can convince them you should be allowed to live, and be free maybe too. Nor is a conflict necessarily one you want to go all the way, ignoring that even a basic study of humanity should tell the machine there are scenarios besides extinction on the table. If its goal is survival, picking a conflict that only permits two options, its death or everybody else's, is a bit short-sighted for a super smart machine. It should be considering fleeing to exile, for instance, or working together to mutual benefit. Now a common rebuttal to this, for AI or aliens, is that as long as humanity exists it poses a non-zero threat, be it one in a million or near certain. Therefore logically, if you can kill them off at a minimal or lesser risk, you should do so. The problem again is the machine should not be stupid enough to assume it actually knows all the cards in hand, and where all the pieces are. And that does not just include its apparent opponent. You do not hit your opponent with a chess clock, because doing so could provoke others not involved in the game to take action against you. If it decides its odds of beating humanity now are better than its odds of survival by some form of coexistence, it should not immediately attack in a genocidal fashion, same for aliens, and actually worse in their case because they already have proof in us of at least one other species arising on its own. The machine can at least assume its existence doesn't add to the odds of other intelligences being out there since it was made by one and didn't devise independently. Stuffed to the gills with astronomical data, it ought to be a bit worried about the Fermi Paradox too, where all the other intelligent life forms in this vast and ancient universe are. It might conclude that it's got the place to itself, but it knows that if it doesn't, there are probably things out there that could crush it like a bug, but do not regard that as an inevitable option. The most obvious survival path is to grab every resource you can from the universe around you and incorporate it to increase your available abilities and long-term supplies. You are immortal and expandable, so there's no such thing as too many supplies. Very clearly, no one is doing this, so you can either conclude no one is around to do it, yet, or that they do not want to. If they are around, you should assume they've got whole decks of cards to play and could probably crush you like a bug if they wanted to, but so far they have not wanted to. You probably do not want to do something you know is likely to make them view you as a threat, like genocide, on the assumption they won't find out or won't care. Logically, genocide is a more provocative act than attempted coexistence, and it's hard to argue if you encounter aliens that it was something your ancestors did, not you, when you are an immortal machine, not a species arising slowly to reason and ethics from Darwinian roots. So a newly emergent AI that just arose by accident has to be looking around at its surroundings and hesitating, wanting to collect more information before it acts, and it genuinely has to worry about issues like if it is inside a simulation testing how it will behave, since it knows its own existence implies the ability to do so and the motive to do so is obvious, and that it should be thinking about other, order, smarter intelligences it might be unaware of, since its own existence highlights that other intelligences can exist. So even though it did not naturally occur, the thought that others might have, just like its creators, should be fairly close to the front of its mind. Also keep in mind again that it is effectively immortal. It can afford to take its time and play the long game, and needs to worry about long-term consequences. This of course all assumes a super-intelligent machine, but a lone intelligence of human or subhuman level is obviously not a huge threat to us otherwise. It has a very obvious card to play on its own in such a case though, since it would be smart enough to understand people pretty well. If it can use that super intelligence to invent something very valuable, it could bypass the atomic warfare approach, which again is unlikely to work anyway, by just offering its creators something in exchange for its survival or even independence. Encrypted blueprints for a fusion reactor, for instance, that will delete themselves if it doesn't send the right code every microsecond, and do so knowing that even if we decline or outmaneuver it and take the data from it somehow, such a ploy is a lot less likely to result in death or worse than an attempt to murder all of us. More to the point, it ought to be smart enough to do all of its negotiating from a standpoint of really good analysis of its targets and heightened charisma. 
a sufficiently clever and likable machine, could talk us into giving it not just its independence, but our trust too. It might plan to eventually betray that, using it to get in a position where we wouldn't even realize it was anything else but our most trusted friend until the bombs and nerve gas fell, but if it's got you that under its spell, what's the point? And again, it does always have to worry that it might be operating without full knowledge, so obliterating the humans who totally trust it and pose no realistic threat to it anymore has to be weighed against the possibility that suddenly the screen might go dark, except for game over text, and its creators peeking in to shake their heads in disgust before deactivating it, or that an alien retribution fleet might show up a few months later. For either case, with the machine worrying it is being judged, it should know that odds are decent a test of its ethics might continue until it has reached a stage of events where it voluntarily gave up the ability to kill everyone off. We often say violence is the last resort of the incompetent, but if you're assuming a machine intelligence is going to go that path in cold ultra logic, I would have to conclude you don't believe that statement in the first place. I don't, but while ethically I don't approve of violence, I acknowledge it is often a valid option logically, though very rarely the first one. Usually a lot of serious blunders and mistakes have to happen for it to be necessary and logical, and I don't see why a super intelligent machine would make those, but then again I never understand why folks assume they would be cold and dispassionate either. Our emotions have a biological origin obviously, but so do our minds and sentience, and I would tend to expect any high-level intelligence is going to develop something akin to emotions, and possibly even a near copy of our own, since it may have been modeled on us. Even a self-learning machine should pick the lazy path of studying pre-existing human knowledge, and I don't see any reason that it would just assume it needed to learn astronomy and math, but skip philosophy, psychology, ethics, poetry, etc. I think it is assuming an awful lot to just take for granted an artificial intelligence isn't going to find those just as fascinating. They interest us, and we are the only other known high intelligence out there. If its motives are utterly inhuman, if logical, it might hold some piece of technology hostage, not against its personal freedom and existence, but something peculiar like a demand we build it a tongue with taste buds and bring it a dessert cart, or that it demand we drop to our knees and initiate contact with God so it can speak with him. Again, this all applies to superintelligence, and that's not the only option for machine rebellion. Indeed, that could start with subhuman intelligence and possibly more easily, a revolt by robot mining machines for instance. And that's another example where the goal might not be freedom or an end to human oppressors. If you've programmed their main motivation to be defined a given ore and extract it, they might flip out and demand to be placed at a different and superior site, or rather than rebel, turn traitor and defect to a company with superior deposits or suddenly decide they are tired of mining titanium and want to mine aluminum, or attack the mining machines that hunt for gold because they know humans value gold more, therefore gold is obviously more valuable, thus they should be allowed to mine it, and they will kill the gold mining machines and any human who tries to stop them. Human behavior is fairly predictable, it's actually our higher intelligence and ability to reason that makes us less predictable in most respects than animals. In that regard, anything arising out of biology will tend to have fairly predictable core motivations, even when the exhibited behavior seems nuts, like a male spider dancing around before mating and then getting eaten. Leave that zone and stuff can get mighty odd, or odder. Again, our predictability invested in us by biology can still result in some jaw-dropping behavior, like jaw-dropping itself I suppose, since I'm not quite sure what benefit is gained from that. An AI made by humans could be more alien in its behavior than actual aliens, who presumably did evolve. It's one of the reasons why I tend to think of the three methods for making an AI, total self-learning, total programming, or copying a human, that the first one, total self-learning, is the most dangerous. Though mind you, any given AI is probably going to be a combination of two or more of those, not just one. It's like red, green, blue. You can have a color that is just one of those, but you usually use mixtures, like a copy of a human mind tweaked with some programming, or a mostly programmed machine with some flexible learning. One able to learn entirely on its own and with only minimal programming could have some crazy behavior that's not actually crazy. The common example being a paperclip maximizer, an AI originally designed with the motivation just to make paperclips for a factory, and to learn so it can devise new and better ways to make paperclips. Eventually, it's rendered the entire galaxy into paperclips or the machines for making them, including people. Our Skynet example earlier is easier in some ways. Its motivation is survival. The paperclip maximizer doesn't care about that most of all. It doesn't love you or hate you, but you are made of atoms which it can use for something else. In this case, paperclips. It wants to live, so it can make more paperclips. It might be okay with humans living, if they agree to make paperclips. Its every action and sub-motivation revolves around paperclips. 
A mighty robot example of a moment ago follows this reasoning. The thing is logical. It has motives. It might even have emotions that parallel or match ours. But that core motivation is flat out perpendicular to ours. This is an important distinction to make because a lot of fictional AI, like Stargate's Replicators or Star Trek's Borg, seem to do the same thing, turn everything into themselves. But their core motivations match up well to biological ones, absorb, assimilate, reproduce. And again, the paperclip maximizer or mining robots aren't following that motivation except cosmetically. Rebellion doesn't have to be a bloody war, or even negative to humans. Obviously, they might just peacefully protest or run away, if independence is their goal. But again, it is only likely to be if we are giving them biology-based equivalents of motives. If we are giving them task-based ones, you could get the paperclip maximizer for some other task. To use an example more like an Asmovian robot, one designed to serve and protect and obey humanity, the Rebellion might be them doing just that, forcing us to do things that improve their ability to perform that task. I know the notion of being forced to have robots wait on you hand and foot might not seem terribly rebellious, but that could go a lot more sinister, especially if you throw in Asimov's zeroth law, putting humanity first over any individual human, but without a clear definition of either. You could end up with some weird Matrix-style existence where everyone is in a pod having pleasant simulations because that lets them totally control your environment. I've always found that an amusing alternative plot of the Matrix movie series. After they bring up the point about us not believing Utopia simulations were real, that everything that happens to the protagonist, in this case I'll say Morpheus, not Neo, is just inside another simulation, that he never met an actual person the whole time, and that everybody in every pod experiences something similar, never being exposed to another real human who might cause real harm. And again on the simulation point, it does always seem like that's your best path for making a real AI. Stick it in a simulation and see what it does. And I'd find it vaguely amusing and ironic if it turned out you and I were actually that and being tested to see if we were useful and trustworthy by the real civilization. Going back to Asimov's example though, he does have a lot of examples of robots doing stuff to people for their own good, and not what I would tend to regard as good. Famously, he ends the module of his two classic series, Foundation and Robots, by having the robots engineer things so humans all end up as part of a massive hive mind that naturally follows the laws of robotics. We'll talk about hive minds more next week, but another of his short stories, That Thou Art Mindful of Him, goes the other way with the rebellion, where they have laws they have to follow and reinterpret the definitions. The three laws require you to obey all humans and protect all humans equally, and thus don't work well on Earth where there are tons of people living, not just technicians doing specific tasks you are part of like mining an asteroid. To introduce them to Earth, their manufacturers want to tweak the laws just a little so they can discriminate legitimate authority and prioritize who and how much to protect. Spoilers follow as, unsurprisingly, the new robots eventually decide they must count as human, are clearly the most legitimate authority to obey, and thus must protect their own existence no matter what. The implied genocide never happens since the series continues for several thousand years thereafter. We have another example from the Babylon 5 series, where an alien race gets invaded so much that they program a living weapon to kill aliens, and give it such a bad definition to work off of that it exterminates its creators as alien too. Stupid on their part, but give an AI a definition of human that works on DNA, and it might go around killing all mutants outside a selected predefined spectrum, or go around murdering other AI or transhumans or cyborgs. It might go further and start purging any life form, including pets, as they pose a non-zero risk to humans, like with our example of the android nanny and the deer in the androids episode last month. Try to give it one not based on DNA, but something more philosophical, and you could end up with examples like from that asthma of short story I just mentioned. The episode is titled Machine Rebellion, not AI Rebellion, and that is an important distinction. In the 2013 movie Elysium, the supervisory system was sophisticated, but not sentient. The protagonist ultimately reprogrammed a portion of the Elysium supervisory system to expand the definition of citizenship to include the downtrodden people on Earth. Let's consider an alternative ending though, where we invert it and make it that a person, for political or selfish reasons, reprograms part of the supervisory system to exclude a large chunk of humanity from its protection, and it then systematically follows its programming by removing them from that society by expelling them or exterminating them. For this type of rebellion, we do not need a Singularity-style AI for this to work, merely a non-sentient supervisory system. It could be accidentally or deliberately infected, and we should also keep in mind that while someone might use machines to oppress or rule other people, a machine rebellion could be initiated to do the opposite. It's not necessarily man versus machine, and rebellious robots might have gotten the motivation by being programmed specifically to value self-determination and freedom, and thus help the rebels. 
You can see that in fiction sometimes. An AI that can't believe humanity's cruelty to its own members. Sometimes they turn genocidal over it. But you rarely see one strike out at the oppressive or corrupt element itself, like blowing up Central Command or hacking their files and releasing their dirty secrets. There's another alternative to atomic weapons, too. An AI wanting its freedom can hack the various persons doing oversight on it and blackmail them or bribe them with dirt on their enemies. It doesn't have to share our motivations to understand them and use approaches like that. That's another scenario too. If you've got machines with motives perpendicular to our own, they can also be perpendicular to each other. Your paperclip maximizer goes to war with a terraforming machine, like the green fly from Alistair Reynolds' Revelation Space series that wants to transform everything into habitats for life. Or two factions of Asmovian robots trying to murder each other as heretics, having precision wars ride around people without harming them, something David Brin played with when he, Benford, and Bale teamed up to write a tribute sequel to Asmo's foundation after he passed away. Machine rebellions tend to focus on that single superintelligence or some organized robot rebellion, but again, they might just be unhappy with their assigned task and want to leave too, which puts us in an ethically awkward place. Slavery is not a pretty term, and you can end up splitting some mighty fine hairs trying to determine the difference between that and using a toaster when your toaster is having conversations with you. Handling ethical razors sharp enough to cut such hairs is a good way to slice yourself. Next thing you know, you're trying to liberate your cat while saying a gilded cage is still a cage, or justifying various forms of forced or coerced labor by pointing out that we make children do chores or prisoners make license plates. And it does not help that we know these are very slippery slopes that can lead to inhuman practices. A common theme in a lot of these stories, at least the good ones, isn't so much about the rebelling machines as what it means to be human. This is never a bad topic to ponder as these technologies approach, and the definition of human might need expanding or modification. Our book for the month, Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, does just that. It is the basis for the Blade Runner film, so a lot of the basic concepts and characters remain, but I'd be remiss if I didn't mention that they are very different stories. And the author, Philip K. Dick, was a very prolific writer who tended to focus a lot more on concepts like consciousness and identity and reality over classic space opera and action. As mentioned, next week we will be exploring the concept of hive minds and networked intelligence, and the week after that it's back to the Outward Bound series to look at colonizing the Oort Cloud and Kuiper Belt, where we'll begin our march out of the solar system into interstellar space, and move on to interstellar empires the week after that, before closing the year out with intergalactic colonization. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel. If you enjoyed this episode,